When the University of Leicester asked for people to explore their history through their archives, I volunteered to take part. When I started this project, Mary Swainson was a complete unknown to me. My main research interest is in the history of disability and in particular the important role that disabled people have played within society. It was in this hall, the Montfort Hall, Leicester, 100 years ago, one of Britain's greatest musicians gave his breakthrough concert. His name was Malcolm Sargent. I have been researching Agnes Fielding Johnson, one of the women who paved the way for Leicestershire and Rutland University College in 1921. I've been looking at the university's coat of arms and its motto, which when translated into English means, so that they may have life. At the start of the University of Leicester's life, an incredible woman named Dr. Ethel Nancy Miles Thomas set up the botany department. It was the first science department at the University of Leicester. The field hospital was used to help soldiers recuperate after World War I, and in doing so, it was helped by Dryad Furniture Company, which was founded by Harry Peach. As the centenary of Leicester University was due in 2021, I wanted to research Harry's story and started in the university archives. Harry went on to be an important benefactor for the university, donating money and items, whilst by the 1930s, Dryad Handicrafts was the world's largest supplier of craft materials. Harry was a businessman, but he was also a philanthropist, and he helped found Leicester University, not only by his many donations, but by his enthusiasm and his support. In 1948, Mary Swainson arrived in Leicester. She was full of new ideas and compassion. She saw a need and worked tirelessly to meet it. It was the right time. The war was over. University College Leicester was growing. New students were arriving. Others were returning, resuming courses delayed by the war. She was a dedicated scientist and made significant discoveries into the fertilization of flowers her passion and zeal started Leicester on its journey to become one of the highest regarded universities in the country for science. On the 3rd of February 1921, he conducted a top flight orchestra in his own composition, composed specially for the occasion, an impression on a windy day. Agnes was an early member of the Leicester Women Suffragettes. She fought alongside the National Union of Women Workers to get quality training for midwives. Her determination led to a substantial improvement for the women and poor of Leicester, and I think she would have seen the university as a continuation of that work. What struck me fairly soon was how interested Harry was in the environment. He was so concerned about people littering that he wrote a pamphlet entitled Let Us Tidy Up, and he got no less a person than King George V to provide the opening statement. Even more impressively, he took on the petrol giant Shell Mex and persuaded them to remove thousands of advertising hoardings that were causing an eyesore throughout the countryside. Her own background had given her an insight into the sorts of problems that students might encounter. She worked energetically to establish a student counselling service. She fought the serious stigma that mental health issues faced, both from the medical profession and public opinion. It was a turning point in his career. His sense of theatre, elegant dress and sheer panache powered a meteoric career in Britain and throughout the world. I've been researching Malcolm Sargent for many years now, and a little known fact that I've only just become aware of is that shortly after his breakthrough concert in 1921, he was appointed head of music at the newly formed Leicester University College. I discovered that there were a lot of different mottos that the university could choose from, including suggestions made by members of the local community. 
Hearing them now gives us a sense of what the people of Leicester wanted the university to become when it opened in 1921. They included worshippers of truth, enemies of falsehood, that life may be fuller and brighter, dare to be wise, I hand on the torch of life, pursuits grow into habits, and the light of the city and its glory. It's been fascinating to use the university records as a window into the upper middle class life of the time and to see how Agnes fought for social change. Sadly, she passed away in 1917, shortly before the university opened, and so she never got to see the city reap the rewards from that. Two years after her death, her husband Thomas bought and donated the land for the university college. The Fielding Johnson building was named after Thomas, but I think it's important that we use it as a reminder of Agnes and all she did for us in Leicester. I am so glad to be able to tell the story of this extraordinary lady who, in her own words, was a pioneer in student counselling. Researching her life, trying to piece together all the different elements gleaned from the university archives and her own published papers for both national and international conferences showed me what a truly remarkable person she was. A force to be reckoned with. It's amazing to see Dr. Thomas's history in the archives and I wonder if she realised that she would be a forerunner for the incredible women scientists that we have at Leicester today. I often wonder what he would make of Leicester today if he could visit the campus. I'm sure at the very least he would be proud that this library in the law school is named the Harry Peach Library in his honour. It's amazing what we can find out about our past right here in Leicester by visiting the university's archives. <laughs>